This is your brain. And if you split it right down the middle, you'll see one of my favorite neural structures right here, the anterior cingulate gyrus. This activates the exact same way if you get hurt or if you watch someone else getting hurt. It's a major control center for empathy. The foundation of almost all human morality lives right there. But there's a big catch. Remember when I said that humans are very tribalistic creatures? Well, this doesn't work nearly as well when you're exposed to the pain and suffering of someone of, say, a different race. But the cool news is, more and more studies are showing the more you expose yourself to different races and different nationalities, the more your brain starts to see those people as, you know, people. This is why I love social media so much. It lets us peer into the day-to-day -day lives of everybody. It highlights our similarities and our differences. And just like getting on a treadmill or lifting weights helps to keep your muscles strong, surrounding yourself with human diversity helps keep your compassion strong. Whenever somebody tells me that they don't believe in evolution, I like to ask them some of the most basic questions that I get asked all the time. Things like, why are there still monkeys if humans came from monkeys? Or, why do scientists have so much faith in Darwin? Or, how can random chance make something as complicated as an eyeball? And if they can't give me an answer for those really genuinely easy questions, I know that it's not their fault that they don't believe in evolution. They've never been taught it properly. Here in America, 60% of high school biology teachers report downplaying evolution or completely ignoring it in their lessons. If you look at this high school biology textbook, you've got lessons on cell theory and germ theory and abiogenesis theory, but they don't throw around the word theory until you get this chapter titled The Theory of Evolution, the only chapter where you find language like scientists believe this and that. If you can't answer those questions I just gave, or if you think that those are actually hard-hitting questions, you've been cheated out of your science education. You should be just as mad as me. Mirrors are fascinating things to think about. The great physicist Richard Feynman used to use mirrors as a thought experiment to help people understand the world in more physical terms. Because it's hard to wrap your brain around the way that they can reverse an image from left to right, but not, say, from top to bottom. This is because mirrors don't reverse images from left to right at all. They reverse them from front to back. That is to say, they don't operate on either the X or the Y axis. They operate on the Z axis. This is why you can see an image in a mirror that's actually perpendicular to the orientation of the mirror. Because there's light bouncing all around the room, reflecting off of every object from every possible angle at all times. But no matter which direction it hits the mirror from, it'll be reflected at an equal and opposite angle. This is also why you can move around the room and see different images in the mirror because the mirror isn't changing, you're just being hit by different angles of light. Or why I can look over to the right and still talk to my camera because I'm sitting at a 45 degree angle to you. Fun to think about, right? I didn't want to have to be the one to do it, but the arguments in my comment sections are insane. So let's go over taxonomy. Now you watching this, I assume, are alive. And being alive, you can only fit into a few different categories. You have a lot of cells, and those cells have membrane-bound organelles and nuclei, which rules out archaea and bacteria right away. You also don't have cell walls, and I'm certain you can't photosynthesize, so plants out of the question as well. Your body isn't constructed of a filamentous network, and you don't reproduce by spores or budding, so fungi goes out the window too. And that only leaves one option. Animals. Humans are animals. What kind of animal are we? Well, we lactate, and we have hair, and that makes us mammals. What kind of mammals are we? Well, we have these fingernails and these crazy thumbs, so almost certain that we're primates. What kind of primates are we? Really, really good shoulder joints, no tails? Apes. Humans are great apes. The actual textbook definition of evolution, the change of allele frequencies in the population over the course of multiple generations, can sound a little bit daunting. But if you really want to understand it, there's just three basic concepts that you need to be able to grasp. Number one, genes are heritable. Parents pass along their DNA to their offspring, and that DNA codes for how those offspring are going to live. Number two, different versions of these genes exist, what we call alleles. Tall or short, light or dark hair, you name it. And new alleles are popping up through random mutation all the time. And finally, number three, different genes make you better suited for life in different environments. An animal that's perfectly adapted for life in the desert is not going to survive in the rainforest, or vice versa. And a harmful or deleterious mutation is going to kill the creature carrying it, where a beneficial mutation will be passed on to the next generation, changing the allele frequency of the population over the course of generations. If you can understand this, you are well on your way to understanding evolution. Do you guys ever get lost thinking about all the colors that you can't see? 
You see, light is categorized into different wavelengths. The smallest wavelength that humans can see is around 400 nanometers. That's what you call purple. But just beyond that, you have ultraviolet, which is way too small for your eyes to detect, but insects can see that one just fine. All the way down to the smallest little light waves in the whole universe, the gamma rays, one trillion times smaller than a meter. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got red, which is 750 nanometers long, but beyond that, you have infrared, which is way too big for you, but like snakes and stuff can see that one all the time. All the way up to the largest light waves that we know about, the extremely low frequency radio waves, 100,000 kilometers long. That's 62,000 miles. Imagine what that must look like. And on this yardstick, we can say that these are things that are 900 billion times smaller than this, all the way up to 100 million times larger than this, almost none of which you can see, and almost all of which are all around you right now. Don't freak out. We're going to talk about math. Studies show that students start feeling anxiety about mathematics around middle school, especially young girls who are taught this nonsense that math and science are like, boy things, screw that. Fear of math is one of the biggest barriers for people to get excited about science. So we're going to work on your math confidence today, okay? Take a look at this. 4 times 4. You know that's 16. And if you don't know that's 16, it's easy. 4 is just a couple of 2s. 2 times 4 is 8. And 2 times 8, that's 16. See what I did there? I changed the numbers just a little bit to make it easier to work it in my head. You're allowed to do that. In fact, it's called the associative property. So try this one. 18 times 4. Oh, I never studied my 18 times tables. but Half of that is 9, and double that is 8, and 9 times 8, that's 72. Half one, double the other. Math's a muscle. you got to work it out. You can't just go from doing nothing to benching 300, right? So I want you to practice on these easy ones down here. I'll come back and check on you in just a little bit. We'll talk about more cool math tricks, okay? I believe in you! Mutation is the driving force of evolution. But a lot of people don't understand just how many different ways a mutation can occur. Consider this seven-letter phrase. We could have one point mutation, where literally just one letter gets switched around. This seems small, but point mutation is because of things like sickle cell anemia, albinism, Tay-Sachs disease, and cancer. Or we could have a deletion event, where a huge chunk of DNA just gets left out. Or on the other side, a duplication event, where a chunk of DNA gets copied twice, leaving twice as much room for further mutations. Or an inversion event, where a chunk of DNA gets flipped around backwards. Or a translocation event, where a chunk of DNA gets mixed up from one chromosome to the next. Any one of these mutations could have monumental effects on the organism carrying them, especially if they're on something like a Hox gene, which is what controls like the whole layout plan of your body. And if that organism passes that mutation on to its offspring, and then through successive generations changes the whole genome of the population, evolution has officially begun. So I was thinking, the sun is constantly producing solar winds, which is just plasma. Superheated charged particles, protons, and electrons flying out through space in all different directions, blasting everything in their path. But the Earth is protected because of what's called our magnetosphere, this big magnetic field that wraps around the Earth like a snuggly blanket and keeps us safe, and that's why we have like an atmosphere and stuff. But at the poles, something kind of weird happens. Where the sun's ionizing radiation meets with our magnetic field at more or less a perpendicular angle, you get lights. Particularly the northern and the southern lights. The aurora borealis and the aurora australis, those magnificent bands of color, are all produced by the interaction of the sun's plasma and our Earth's magnetic field. So what if you could take a bunch of plasma and put it in a little box, and then put a few thousand of those little boxes all together in like a big grid, and then pass an electrical charge through them to make those colors and lights come alive and produce like pictures and shapes and stuff? That's called a plasma screen TV. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. That's called Charles' Law. It was developed back in 1787 by the French scientist Jacques Charles, who taught us that the temperature and the volume of a gas are directly proportional. So just as 1 over 2 is the same thing as 2 over 4, if we increase the temperature of the gas inside this container, the volume has to increase at the exact same rate. The expanding gas forces the fluid out of the way up the spout, which makes this effectively a thermometer, showing us the difference in temperature between the room at about 70 degrees and my body at about 100 degrees. If I wanted to reverse this, all I have to do is just grab the top of the flask, or I could even just breathe on it as the heat of my breath forces the fluid down the spout, but then the evaporation cools off the top bulb and sucks the fluid right back up. This is how hot air balloons fly, as hot gas is less dense, or why you have to reinflate your tires in the wintertime, as cold gas shrinks down. To me, it reminds me of the profound effect that every single molecule has on the universe around it. Thanks, Jock.